While people are joining, I want to welcome you from my side to the second theme in our series called Next Stop, Approaching the Future of Mobility. Our event journey surfaces ideas and insights from mobility experts in our four main topics, micromobility, hyperloop, simulation, and autonomous vehicles. And we are not doing this alone. It is a collaboration with the Swiss Federal Railways, SBB. Over several months, we will feature a mix of panels and presentations with thought leaders, presentations from leading startups, insights into the most cutting edge new vehicles and networking opportunities, of course. I'm really impressed by the great uh, round of speakers we've gathered today in collaboration with Eurotube to discuss how to build a Hyperloop technology. Without further ado, I'm happy to introduce our moderator for this panel, Andreas Josen, Head of Technology and Innovation Outpost at SPP. Here with me at the pier. Andreas, please take it away. Thank you very much, Nicola, for the nice words and also welcome from my side. Good morning, Bay Area and California and good evening, Switzerland. Yeah, as Nicola mentioned, this is the second stop in our next stop approaching the future of mobility series. Um, so I'm very proud to have a super great expert panel for, for all of you. So please, audience members, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them directly in our Q&A uh, section. Um, Nicola and I will be looking through them and try to involve them as much as we can during our panel. Um, and now, without any further ado, let's jump in right with our great uh, panelists. We have four speakers today, and the first one is Fabio Dubois. He's Technology Director at Eurotube Foundation. Please welcome Fabio. Hi, Andreas. Nice Hi, to good be evening. Panel. I can give you a quick uh, introduction to what we do at the Eurotube Foundation. Exactly, yes, please. Let me share the screen. Can you see this? Does that work? It's okay. loading almost there. Take some time to cross <laughs> Atlantic. Good. That's still black for me. It's all good. Please go. Oh, yeah. Good, great. So happy to be on the panel and to answer the question of how to build Hyperloop. So from our mission and our vision of building Hyperloop in a sustainable way, we say that building Hyperloop is by testing it. So here is what we envision as a infrastructure from having a Hyperloop working. So these are the six domains that we do our product development and innovation in. It's a linear actuation, shell subtract technologies, vacuum valves for safety reasons for isolating and also making a safe uh, air locking of the high speed vehicles. It is of course also the thematics around power and energy, the public system, which of course needs to be there to have a vacuum assurance and the telecommunication. So maybe going quickly into the pumping system um, infrastructure component, just to give you a bit of insight, what we develop here at the YouTube Foundation together with our partners, be it industry, but also academia. Um, maybe here just to give some key um, insights and some key performance indicators, we look into multi-phase pump down machinery, turbo machinery that is able to sustain um, really a low vacuum pressure environment. Maybe here the key performance indicator is the 20 minutes per second that we use or that we need to make a pump down. Um, another important technology is the linear actuation maglev system. Uh, maybe most of you are familiar with trans repeat systems or other maglev systems that are relevant for high speed operation. Also, this is a technology that we co develop with research partners at ETH Zurich, at EPFL, and also German institutes um, to really offer a viable and really high performance solution for the high speed um, operation. Maybe here again, just an insight and a, and a picture of um, past developments. There we looked at trackside launch and recovery propulsion systems, 
And again, here, a key performance indicator as we have it for our alpha tube infrastructure is the 80 kilonewtons thrust that we um, developed and that we need for our launcher system. So again, uh, another very crucial and important subsystem are the valves um, in order to enable an air locking of the vehicles to actually have the vehicles be encapsulated into the low pressure environment, vacuum valves are essential. And also this is something that uh, uh, we at the European Foundation as a nonprofit research institute, we do research on this. We have a material innovation project on this. I'm happy to give more insights on this if this is of any interest to any one of you. Again, a picture on this, um, yes. And maybe last but not least, of course, what is also very important for a working infrastructure is the shell and subtract system. There is super many variants of floor suspended, but also ceiling suspended subtract systems from different companies, from different initiatives. Also in this field of technology, uh, the YouTube Foundation and also myself, I, we try to bring in um, a collaboration. We try to bring in a platform that enables to uh, yeah, jointly develop these um, future subtrack um, and guiding systems for vacuum transport. Again, here an insight from a recent uh, update from our project, the Beta Shell project. Maybe here an important key performance indicator for the audience uh, the allowable leakage that we uh, allow for our infrastructure is uh, 50 SLM standard liters per minute. Good. Maybe to just wrap it up, uh, what is the Eurotube Foundation doing? We are uh, a research and incubation platform here in Switzerland, um, forming a large network of academic and industry partners, and we accelerate the sustainable transport from the academic research uh, on the left-hand side to a commercial application on the right-hand side by joining forces with leading industry companies and research institutions. So it is important for us that we um, look at the technology readiness level of Hyperloop as an entire infrastructure solution, but also at the different uh, subsystems. And uh, we were founded in 2017. And since then, we have been pushing the boundaries, pushing the limits, um, and we're hopefully soon opening the AlphaTube uh, research track uh, that will be available for the public and our partners to test their technology, their vehicle concepts on a fully integrated platform. And this will also then be the journey to acceleration to market. This is also a very important uh, aspect that we um, look at, of course, the viability aspect that enables us then finally to yeah, present Hyperloop as a commercial um, yeah, mode of transportation for everyone, hopefully in five or 10 years from now. Yes, this all is united in the Alpha Tube research structure. Just to give you again an impression of what we envision to build and what is currently in the, in the construction. Um, it is a 3.1 kilometer test track in the middle of Switzerland in the mountain region. Um, in the back, you would see the Lake of Geneva. Um, that's the platform that we provide to our network and to the research of infrastructure. Happy if you follow our progress, um, we would be very happy to keep you in the loop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fabio. And it's great to see that Switzerland is actually on the forefront as well on this innovation and uh, pushing it forward. So we're switching from Switzerland now to California. Next on stage, I welcome Diana Zhu, who is the Senior um, Director of Global Alliances and Policy at Virgin Hyperloop. Hi, Diana. Good morning. Hi, Andreas. Thank you so much for having me here today. Yeah, it's, it's a, a pleasure. pleasure to be here. Um, let me just share my um, screen. Give me one moment here. There we go. Okay. Um, again, it's great. It's great to be here. Um, and I'm really excited that we're having this conversation on both sides of the ocean. Um, and it's so great that you have been able to, um, to arrange this. Um, I am Virgin Hyperloop's Senior Director of Global Alliances and Policy. And what that means essentially is 
Um, I go around the world uh, developing partnerships, working with various transportation departments to understand how we can commercialize um, the hyperloop technology. Um, I was actually really um, interested in, in hearing um, Fabio's presentation before mine. Um, I was taking notes actually, Fabio, as you were talking about the various technologies that you have developed and um, uh, you know the, the, the things with the, with the gate valve, with um, your automated um, tube sealants. And I think there's a lot of um, you know, great things that we're both working on um, and, and could hopefully work on together moving forward. So um, really great to see all the research that is being done in this area. Um, let me first start by talking about this system, the Virgin Hyperloop system that we are developing. Um, at a high level, it is um, a enclosed vacuum structure. So we take all of the air um, out of the tube um, to one one thousandths of atmosphere pressure. Um, so it's similar to flying at 200,000 feet in the air. Uh, we have a pod um, it, which can carry both passengers as well as cargo. Um, when it comes to carrying passengers, um, we are looking at roughly 28 passengers per pod. Um, and we have built our uh, electric magnetic propulsion system, um, which propels the pod completely electronically. Um, oh, sorry, electrically. So um, there are no direct emissions. It's a very sustainable new mode of transportation. Um, and we've also done this by um, developing an active magnetic levitation system. Um, so there are no wheels, um, you know, so you don't have um, the, the wear on uh, wear and tear that comes with wheels um, that you would with, um, with rail. So um, the magnetic levitation system also allows it to go um, really, really fast um, over a thousand kilometers per hour. Um, and all of that is tied together with our autonomous control platform. Um, so what you see here is one pod and one tube, um, you know, moving at a very high speed. Um, but a lot of the development that we've been working on uh, more recently is actually how does this pod fit within a network? Um, how can we how can we build the system so that it is demand responsive to um, people coming into um, the portals, what we call our stations, um, and how we can actually service um, a network of passengers um, moving um, at speeds uh, unprecedented. Here are a couple of renderings that we have recently released um, in terms of how the system will look in both its environment as well as the interior. Um, so you can see a couple of the key features here. Um, one, it's a high capacity mass transit system. So when people think about Hyperloop, a, a question that we get a lot is, well, is it for, is it a luxury product for the, for the ultra rich? Um, this is not meant to be that type of system at all. Uh, we are designing this to be a mass transportation system. Um, and when we talk about high capacity, we're talking about um, up to 50,000 people per hour per direction, which is extremely high. Um, and we're able to do this by use of convoying. Um, what that means is we're able to virtually link up pods together um, during uh, peak hours. Uh, we have also designed a warm, personalized passenger experience. Uh, our vision for the future is not this dystopian, chaotic, vision we're creating something that is that feels warm it feels comfortable it feels safe um, because when people are riding in the system um, they need to be assured that it is a comfortable experience for them and so uh, we have worked with um, some of the world's leading architects and designers to understand how we can create an environment um, within our pods that feels very familiar um, almost to something that they've experienced before so you can almost see here on the in the picture on the lower um, left hand, that it's it's kind of a mixture between a, a very comfortable um, rail car and an aircraft, um, and a lot of that lighting and the mood is is very intentional. Um, one of the things that separates our system, we think, from existing modes uh, available today is that it is it is on demand and it's also direct to destination. Um, what that means is uh, you can call up a pod 
when you need to go. So you're not beholden to a fixed schedule. Um, and we're able to do that uh, because of the autonomous software platform that I mentioned previously. Um, another really important part of the system is that it's direct to destination. And so um, it's similar to riding an express train. You basically get into the pod that goes to the direction to the destination that you are um, intending to go, and there are no stops along the way. Um, and we can do that because we have a very small, fairly small pod of only up to 28 people. So you don't have to wait for hundreds of uh, other passengers to show up to make it efficient to move the, the, um, the pod forward. Um, you only need to wait um, for um, 27 other passengers and uh, we're able to utilize the system uh, more efficiently that way. And then finally, uh, we are developing the, the system so that it is it has very flexible uh, infrastructure that is that allows it to integrate with other modes. Um, so you can see here a rendering of how our station or portal uh, would integrate with a cityscape. Um, our footprint is smaller than um, many other systems out there in the world today, most rail systems. Uh, and because we're in an enclosed tube, um, we don't have a lot of the issues that um, other modes may have when it comes to noise pollution, when it comes to interference, um, when it comes to um, at grade crossings um, and things like that. So I've talked a lot about the vision. Um, what have we actually done? Uh, Virgin Hyperloop is a company that has been around for the last seven years. Um, we were formed in 2014, and we are now based out of uh, Los Angeles, and we now have over 300 employees um, in our in our R&D facility in Los Angeles. We also have a 500 meter um, test facility in um, Las Vegas, outside of uh, Las Vegas. Um, this is where we've been running tests since 2017. Um, we've built our 500 meter um, tube called DevLoop. Uh, we hit 387 kilometers per hour on that uh, on that test facility back in 2017. Um, and we've now taken it a step further um, since then to demonstrate how we can build the system so that's safe for passengers. A really big and important milestone for us just a few months ago uh, was we had the first passengers ever travel safely on a Hyperloop. Um, so this is a, a picture you see here of our co-founder, Josh Geigel, and our head of passenger experience, Sara Lukian, um, in the world's first Hyperloop ride. Uh, this was extremely, extremely exciting for us. Um, they rode in a two-seater prototype vehicle. Um, the purpose of this really was to demonstrate the safety critical aspects of the system. So before anybody boarded onto um, the pod, the entire process was verified by an independent safety assessor certifier. Um, we reached speeds of just over uh, 170 kilometers an hour um, in a vacuum environment. And finally, I'll just end with a short video because it's nothing quite um, the same as uh, seeing it for yourself. We are driven to explore, to connect, to innovate, to muster the courage to take a giant leap forward. The time has come to ask ourselves again, what is the future we want to build? All right, team, please confirm you're ready. 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 Pegasus, this is Capcom. Prepare for launch in three, Two, one, launch. Today, the first people traveled safely on a Hyperloop. Tomorrow, Virgin Hyperloop will change the way the world moves with an on-demand, sustainable mass transportation system that connects cities in minutes. The future of Hyperloop travel is real, and the moment is now. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your questions um, and continue the conversation. Turn it back over to you, Andreas. Thank you very much, Diana. And it's great to see that the people are very happy when they write the Hyperloop. Almost as happy as they are when they are on the Swiss trains, I, I think. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so next we go back to Switzerland. Um, after having a Hyperloop infrastructure company and a Hyperloop infrastructure and pot company, we're going to a company that is going in a completely different way that is coming maybe not directly from the Hyperloop area, but is having a lot of experiences and insights from the tunneling um, infrastructure. So next on stage, please welcome Mark von Heinigen, who is the chief digital officer at Cablex in Switzerland. Hi, Mark. You're still muted. Thank you for having me on the panel. And let me also share some slides that I prepared. Um, mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of innovation in the background that you actually don't see, right? Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. OK, great. Um, Yes, uh, my name is Mark van Heining and I work at a, at a company called Cablex. And what we... Um, hold on. Now, what we mainly do is we basically build the infrastructure. We are, in a way, a construction company building the infrastructure for um, mainly telecommunication, for, for, for communication. So we build wireline, wireless, 5G networks, um, throughout Switzerland, we help in the development, the, the, the connectivity fiber to the home that we have in Switzerland, and we um, excuse me, and we apply those technologies also in transportation, where those technology are being used in order to to operate um, safely. And we also have a project, and we work with with government and enterprises in order to to use that infrastructure to be successful. So. Um, You may think, why is a telco guy on, uh, on this panel? So while building the next um, generation telecommunications and electricity networks for those companies, we really install those technology and those, those electricity um, to ensure that you can travel safely. And what you see here is, is a picture of the Chenery Basis Tunnel, um, the most modern um, railway tunnel recently finished in Switzerland, where um, trains can ride up to about 250 kilometers an hour. It's about 15 kilometer long tunnel filled with technology in order to make sure that the transportation can operate as smoothly and as safely as, as we expect it to do. And what you see here is a, is a, is a, um, a side tunnel. So there, are, there are two tubes, they're running parallel to each other. And, and, and there are 17 of those, of those in-between tunnels filled with technology. And as we've seen in, in the, the two previous discussions, technology evolves immensely in transportation and not only on, on hyperloop travel, but also in, in, in how shall I say, more traditional um, um, railway travel. So between those two tubes, you see it's filled with, with um, equipment to measure and to monitor and to steer the operations of those tunnels. So while they are on one hand safe and escape um, tunnels, they're also filled with technology. And it's my company who has installed those type of um, um, uh, equipment in order to operate and run those, um, those tunnels. So you can see here, those are these, these um, cabinets installed with, with technology and they are being operated in the tunnel. Now you can see, and you can understand when this um, um, infrastructure is in place, it's very expensive to access it. Sometimes it's difficult, very often it's unsafe, and it is very, um, um, very costly in order for, for us to, to stop that and access it. So we have built a digital twin of this, of this infrastructure. So while we have built it on one hand in, a, in, a, in the real world, so we have installed those cabinets with all the technology, we have also built a virtual um, image of those, um, of those tunnels, a digital twin. Now, why is that interesting? While in the past, um, people used to be trained in, in replicas or even inside the tunnel in order to, to, to handle those, those equipment, we are now training the SPV people virtual, um, virtually and um, complete. So, um, they can access with a, with a virtual reality glasses on 
they go into the tunnel, they open those, those um, cabinets, as you can see here, and they actually can um, train all the exercises. They are able to, to read instructions, they see what is available in the, different, in the different cabinets, and transactions that are being done in the virtual reality are actually linked to the real world. So switching on and off a switch in virtual reality is being seen in the real world at the same time. So that allows us to access, in a way, this tunnel 24 um, um, 24 seven without having to stop operations within the tunnel. At the same time, the same technology is being used for augmented reality. So um, when it then comes and becomes necessary that you enter those tunnels, you can, uh, we can equip the, the technicians with an augmented reality where the same information that's available in virtual reality is present to the technician. So when he or she opens one of those cabinets, they can access all the information about the, the, the switching, the wiring, the cabling in order to, um, to execute their, their services. And we are thinking um, and taking it a step further because while um, it is still necessary today to sometimes to, to change a switch or, or, or to do um, cleaning and maintenance, you can understand those, those tunnels, they get dirty, a lot of dust. We are thinking about how can we even reduce the need for, for humans to interact in those tunnels and see robots actually acting um, uh, instead of the humans in combination with, with the technology in order to, to do the, the tasks that are really necessary in order for those infrastructures to run safely and, and, and as smoothly as, as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. That is great. And to circle back to something what Diana said before, Hyperloop wants to become a mass transit system. So let's talk to, to someone who is actually working for a mass transit system for the railway company. So I'm very glad to join, to have on, on stage now Joe Huller, who is the senior innovation consultant for automation and digitalization at SBB, the Swiss Railway. Good evening, Joe. You're still on mute. Um, so I have one question for you. So all these concepts, the new Hyperloop, um, the new speeds and so on. So they're tackling into an area where a railway company has a lot of experience. So what do you think can Hyperloop learn actually from a railway operator? I believe that the vacuum transportation Hyperloop system is an excellent idea. And uh, I really, uh, I'm excited to see what's going on. What I learned from my experience with railway is if you have a border crossing system, one of the killing grounds is the border because Germany has not the same like Switzerland. A train from Rotterdam through Germany, Switzerland to Italy needs four pantographs because we have four current uh, systems. The train control system are different. The pilots are not allowed to run through the other country with a special permit and training. So key success factor number one for a system like Hyperloop, which will be border crossing, must be standard interoperability and also cross acceptance for the vehicles. So and one side is infrastructure, the other is the vehicles and the operation, interoperability. The second key issue, especially with what I learned in Europe, is how you finance that. This Hyperloop system will not be cheap. It's not that easy like you have it in California where you just can put the tube on the sand in the desert. If you look at our mountainside, our uh, geographical situation, the majority in Switzerland for Hyperloop system would be tunnels and some bridges because with that speed, you cannot follow the, mount, the, the mountainside. This means a lot of investment, also 15, maybe 20 years building time for uh, one line through Switzerland. And who is willing to invest in such an infrastructure when he has to wait to get the first dollar back uh, after 20 years. And if you look how the railway system have developed, 
And Europe is this uh, is here a good example only if somebody is willing to invest in such a transportation system, it will come up. It's not, in my opinion, a big business making uh, opportunity. It's a change in the system and therefore organize financing well ahead, uh, especially for the infrastructure, because the downwriting on the infrastructure should be in the area of minimum 50 years. So it's not big return uh, on investment business. And if you look at the development we have seen in France, in Switzerland, in Germany, in Austria, if not somebody saying we will have that and we invest for that, it will not happen. Best example is uh, the big line we have built for $20 billion uh, the tunnels through the Alps, but in the north and in the south, the infrastructure is missing that we can't fully use it. So this took this success factor as a message, standard interoperability and cross acceptance. And on the other side, a good solution for the financing, especially, especially for the infrastructure. So in your opinion, does that mean that the government should be in the driver's seat in order to launch uh, such new initiatives? Well, if the government would do that, it will disorate the process. It should be in the interest of the involved parties to say, okay, what is good as a standard is not a political issue, it's a good solution and we accept it for everybody. We have the same diameter, we have the same uh, currency, or we have the same safety procedure, we have the same train control procedure. And if the involved parties are doing this, we don't need to stay. Today, if you look at the history of a railway, it's very old fashioned, it's very localized. Uh, some are running on the left side of a two track system, also are running on the right side because some countries were invaded by Napoleon, others, ne others not. So we have to take this history out and stand together. Let's be competitor on some, some issues, but I don't want to change a Hyperloop system when I cross the border. That would not be the solution. I want to run with Mac 1 from Zurich to Hamburg and back. Yeah, interesting. In less than an hour. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Um, so let's involve everyone now on the panel. Um, maybe a question for Diana and Fabio as well. Uh, on a point that Joe just brought in, the borders and the, the geographical regions are probably one of the most important points when it comes to the development of different Hyperloop initiatives. And there's a lot going on here in California. There's some initiatives in, in Europe and also in Switzerland and South Korea, I think as well, had the last year a success where they tested something. So where will it happen? Who will be first? Should we all work together or will there be an Asian si system, uh, an American system and a European one? What do you think about this, Diana? Yeah, so I'm, I'm really glad you, you opened it up because I was kind of just itching to <laughs> respond to to Joe on that, um, it's a really important um, point that, that Joe has brought up. And, and actually, when we started um, engaging with the European Commission around um, you know, how we can commercialize and deploy Hyperloop systems, this was one of the first things that came up um, because uh, they have seen, Europe in particular, has seen the issues with um, having to fit together the rail system after uh, the various national rail networks have been developed um, and that has taken a long time. Um, and there, there have been um, many, many challenges in, in doing that. And as Joe mentioned, you know, when you board on, when you board a train in Switzerland, through Italy, through, through Germany, you know, you have to change um, at the borders. And there's definitely that issue with um, if with the different systems not being interoperable. So I, I think the European um, Commission um, and DG Move in particular is the um, group within the EC that we have been working very closely with. Um, 
they understand the challenges of doing this and they are actually very proactive in trying to get ahead of this um, by having a set of working group meetings um, over the last two years where all of the Hyperloop industry players have gotten together in a room um, with the transport authority, with the transport um, policymakers and the safety authorities, um, a couple of the regulatory authorities as well to discuss this very issue. Um, what are the safety requirements when it comes to a Hyperloop system? What are the functional blocks of a Hyperloop system that we can all agree on? Um, is it possible to agree on the terms of interoperability at this point? There are a lot of views on that. Um, on one hand, if you push interoperability too far, um, when the technology is still in an infant stage, you risk getting stuck with um, a version of the system that is not ideal, that is not optimized. Um, and so I think there are, uh, but, but on the other hand, if you wait too long, then you risk um, all the different companies splitting up and developing their own um, system architecture when it comes to the Hyperloop. So, so there are a lot of um, debates that we're actually having at the moment um, with regards to how this very important issue is, is addressed. Um, I also want to mention that um, there is a standards group um, within the Sun Senelec um, European standards body that is looking specifically at standards for Hyperloop. Um, this actually is a very important topic. Um, just over the last few um, months, um, this group JTC20 has been set up, uh, was set up at the end of last year to look specifically at Hyperloop. And there are a number of different um, member states that are, uh, that come together every few months to discuss these, these very topics. Um, in the US, there, there's also uh, the Non-Traditional and Emerging Transportation uh, Technologies Council, the NET Council, um, that uh, at the end of uh, December released the Hyperloop Standards Desk Review, which lists a set of standards that could be applicable to Hyperloop. Not saying that they will be applicable, but that could be applicable to Hyperloop, taken from rail, taken from aviation, taken even from um, space. So, so these are very important topics that are being discussed. Now, as a company, of course, you know, our vision is to be able to connect um, all of Europe from one end to the other with the same system, um, having, um, you know, different uh, partners in, in developing the system, but ultimately having one interoperable system that could be, uh, that could be utilized. Um, but I think a lot of this really will really depend also on how things play out um, with the European Commission, how things move forward um, in that regards. And how do you come up with new standards for something that hasn't been there for, for innovations like this? Well, I, I think it's actually not that new when you break down the pieces of it. It's really the fitting together of everything that is new. Right, maglev has been around um, for you know decades already. We have maglev systems that have already been deployed, um, and so in that sense, you can take a lot of the um, standards when it comes to rail and and maglev to understand how we might um, think about that. Um, at the end of the day, Hyperloop is uh, a type of linear infrastructure, so building a system, a vacuum system, sh definitely has its challenges. Um, but uh, it is similar to building uh, a bridge or a highway um, or a, a new rail line, right? In terms of the, the types of uh, challenge, the geographical um, and terrain challenges that it, that it faces. So there are aspects of this that we can certainly learn from, from existing industries, specific, uh, especially mature industries that have been around that have done this for many years. Um, and I think there are a couple of uh, new standards that will need to be developed, um, but, uh, but there's a lot that, you know, I think we can also learn from others, um, like Joe here um, on this call from what's already been done. Maybe, Fabio, do you think that you can bring Switzerland to the foreground with this? Is Switzerland taking an active part in, in the whole, this whole development? 
Sure. I mean, uh, we try to be also at the forefront together with our partners, together with uh, international partners. Uh, it's not something that we can develop ourselves and our own on our small test benches. I think, uh, as also Diana was mentioning, these uh, high speeds, high powers, they need to be tested in full scale. We, we, we saw a nice video. And I think it's also an incremental process. Maybe coming back to the standardization question, um, it was mentioned that the European Committee for Standardization is now more and more streamlining those processes, at least in Europe. I think there's also um, very similar regulatory organisms uh, in, in the US doing similar things. Um, and also the JTC20 initiative kind of is really pushing this. I think we very much welcome this uh, standardization, but also I think a pointer from my side is really that we need to also invest uh, in actually proving the technology and its scalability and actually also its sustainable integration. Uh, standardization is good to yeah take it into account from the very beginning. I mean, also in the design process already, um, but also actually proving um let's say these interfaces that are uh, known but yeah these interplays need to be tested i think this is some, something that we need to keep in mind as well and of course uh, andreas uh, switzerland is uh, very much kind of um interested in doing this kind of reach research also with the swiss metro project back in the 70s there is a lot of know-how in, in switzerland and uh, also when it comes to tunneling digging tunnels through the mountains this is something that uh, we are quite famous for so there is some competence around in Switzerland and also, of course, in Europe that uh, we try to bring together um, within Eurotube and the Altitude Trust Track and really uh, find a best matching and a nice fitting uh, full full technology solution to that. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. Maybe a question um, for Mark before we turn to some audience questions. So Mark, we heard a lot about standardization, different technologies. So what about the existing infrastructure, for example, in tunnels? Uh, as you mentioned, there's some kind of digital twin for some tunnels. Um, so how are you tackling this right now in, in the real world, so to say? Um, does every tunnel have different technologies and, and do you need to upgrade it every few years or, or how does that actually look like? Well, as we as we see technology evolve, we will also see um, upgrades coming more regularly than we have seen in the past. Um, a lot of those tunnels and a lot of those um, equipment being installed in these tunnels is actually not for operating the, 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 the railway in itself, but are purely there to secure safety for for people traveling and working in those in those in those tunnels. So from that perspective, regulatory um, requirements are very, are very relevant for us because they, in a way, are the foundation why this technology there is in the first place. The trains, for example, they would run through, through that tunnel also without um, anyone monitoring what, what air quality would be there. So a lot of those or, or making sure that, that, that everybody can find a way or light or connectivity and all those types of things. And, and that is going to increase even more as, as technology advances. And um, we are thinking about um, what does that mean actually for, for new forms of transportation? So um, while it is, it is um, if you put a, a high, an, under, an under pressured tube under the ground, you cannot access that very easily or not quickly for maintenance. At the same time, you don't want to stop that, that operations at all times to, to check whether your sensors are, are, are there or if, if all the information is, is, is right. Or how do we get, how do we clean um, those, those tubes um, while we are at the same time operating? So those are questions we are, we are um, thinking about in order um, to, to develop the technology to evolve those, those things. Today we see a big variety of different technologies. So, so a lot of those, those tunnel projects are all individual projects. So we see a certain standard of, of technology, but if you then look at them individually, there's still a, a large difference. And, and every new project is, um, is taking new technology in, into, uh, into account. Since those are so long projects, sometimes decisions for technologies are, are based on, on a view that, 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 that dates back 10, 15 years. And then it changes again, yeah, that goes quickly. Um, 
You mentioned something underground, which is a perfect segue to an audience question from Klaus Watcher, who's asking, and I think this is um, directed to Fabio, is your system above ground or underground? Yes, our Alpha Tube system is above ground. We want to um, install an infrastructure that is you know, some kind of similar to what is yeah, to be expected for the, for the actual Hyperloop system, for the above ground scenario. And above ground scenario in our case, because it is more flexible and also less cost, um, let's say, um, yeah, less capital intensive in, in, in the end. But of course, there is there is many different uh, kinds of, of Hyperloop and, and tube systems. We talk from elevated to grounded, to trenched, to board, to even floated or, or, or moored systems. I think uh, there is um, this linear infrastructure can be installed really up really up high on, on, on kind of pillars, pylons, or can be even yeah, well buried be below, below ground, as we know it uh, from other um, tunneling projects. Yes. But in our case, it is an above, an above ground uh, scenario. Yes. Mm -hmm. What about Hyperloop, uh, Virgin Hyperloop, Diana? Above or underground or both? Uh, it could be either one. I mean, the tube doesn't care whether or not it's above ground or below ground, but um, as, as Fabio uh, mentioned, um, it is generally more cost effective to build above ground. Um, when you're building below ground, the tunneling costs um, are, are quite high, depending on where you're building. Um, uh, and so that's why our system out in Nevada is above ground on columns. Mm -hmm. We have another audience question from Leo Berkey that is directed to the Iena, and he's asking about the vessel capacity um, for passengers, so the 28 people. Why did, or how did you come to this? Can you walk us through this thought process? Is it a technical, technically optimal size? Um, or are there other limitations? Or he's also asking, um, does that include also some escorts? So for well-being purposes, what if someone falls ill from the transportation? Yeah, so so just to answer the, the last one, the 28 passengers is, is just the number of passengers. So there's no, at this moment, there's no um, uh, intention to put um, an attendant on the pod, though certainly if you think about when we roll it out for the, for the first time, we may have um, some folks that are on it to, to assist passengers. Um, but, um, but our target design includes 28 passengers. Um, this number was actually arrived um, at from a lot of analysis, um, both on the on the construction cost perspective, but also in terms of how we can ensure that the system is demand responsive. Um, it is probably going to be cheaper to build a longer pod um, that fits, you know, hundreds of people. But when you're thinking about um, the flexibility from an infrastructure perspective, um, a longer pod means that you are you have to have a larger turn radius uh, radii, which means that you're more limited in terms of how the infrastructure can fit into existing environments. Um, and as you all mentioned, um, I've heard several times on this call today that the landscape in Switzerland is very difficult, is notoriously probably difficult to build in because of all the mountains. Um, and so when we are designing the system, it is not just to design uh, a pod that can go at a thousand kilometers an hour. Um, we are also very much looking at how do we actually build a system um, that addresses many of the challenges that we see in the world today, which is one that infrastructure projects are hard to build because it takes long time to build, it's costly, um, but also leveraging the investments in infrastructure that have been made over the last um, few decades. So one of the things that we have studied quite a bit is you know, whether or not our system can run alongside a highway um, and be able to utilize existing rights of way alongside highways um, by doing that. And uh, and actually, in one of the studies that we did in Missouri, we looked at, uh, you know, putting a hyperloop alongside um, the I-70 interstate highway, and uh, and we we found that for about 70% of that route, we could actually do it that way. Um, 
those are really important to us. So that's just one example of why the length of our pod is, is a certain length. Um, and then also from a demand side, um, you know, having a smaller pod fitting um, a smaller number of people onto the onto the pod allows it to um, to have a more packetized um, uh, operational model uh, and be able to service those people faster without having to wait uh, for hundreds of passengers to show up. Mm -hmm. Joe, considering your background from a railway company, do you see Hyperloop as a competitor or is it more uh, like a first and last mile addition to the traditional railway? Now, the Hyperloop system, in my opinion, is never a uh, competitor to railway uh, in the traditional way. I believe it's the competitor for aviation. If we use this speed, Mach 1, then we will have a few stops. We will have long distances, 300, 500, 1,000 kilometers to the next stop. If we connect that to the fine distribution at the, at the big main station or another transportation system, whatever it is, bicycle, uh, self-driven cars, traditional railways, street cars, whatever, I think then we produce a value because the passenger don't care with what he is riding at the end of the day. They want to be easy, fast from A to B. So I think it's a little bit an obligation that we think that way. Uh, not too many stations. It's, in my opinion, a good substitute for medium range aviation. If we will transfer ever the Pacific or the ocean, I don't know, but on, on the continents, it's absolute a valuable good solution and not in competition with traditional railway. But you will probably will have a surcharge if you can travel with Mac one instead of uh, humbling around with uh, 30 miles per hour. <laughs> yes, we have a lot of uh, viewer questions. And one, Blake, is asking, what are the biggest challenges of these Hyperloop technologies at the moment? Or, or what are the biggest risks? Um, Diana, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I, I think, you, you know, um, some of the biggest challenges, I, I think people traditionally think of the technology challenges, you know, how do you create um, a vacuum tube that's able to withstand this pressure? How do you create a pod that can safely transport people? Um, and I think those are very real challenges. Um, but as a company, those are challenges that we can address within our company and we can hire the right people to, um, to engineer those, those challenges and work on those challenges. Um, what is much harder actually um, are some of the things that, that Joe has been talking about. So when it comes to deploying this and actually building this, um, how do we actually do that? As a new mode of transportation, there are a lot of uh, challenges when it comes to building in urban environments. Um, there are a lot of challenges when it comes to what the regulatory framework looks like. How do we certify the system for um, passenger so that it is safe. Um, how do we fund these, these systems? Um, uh, many rail companies and um, many um, aviation companies also uh, and airports um, are funded using public um, money. You know, is that something that is going to be available for uh, new modes of transportation like Hyperloop? Um, it's, it's unclear, um, though there was actually a ruling last, um, there was a guidance document last year that was released by the US Department of Transportation, which announced that um, Hyperloop would be eligible for many of the funding and financing programs that are available to rail. So that's a huge step forward in terms of, of allowing us to um, actually have the tools to build these, these projects and make it commercially viable. Um, but I think a lot of those, those challenges, the big ones, the really big ones are the ones um, that we do not control as the technology companies, they're the technology developers, um, but really it's working in conjunction with policymakers, 
um, regulators around the world to understand how we can build this. Fabio, what's your view? <laughs> yeah, maybe just if I can add a very small point to that. Um, I fully agree with Diana. So these regulation and also the, the financing issues need to be solved, need to be addressed. Uh, what also is uh, an, an issue that we come across a lot when talking to people is how do we actually integrate this um, hyperloop um, infrastructure into the existing network? The intermod intermodality and the interoperability are, are things that need to be solved. Is it a hyperloop to rail? Is it a hyperloop to road interoperability that we should be aiming for? I, I was also seeing some questions reg regarding the autonomous driving. How much should we co-develop uh, technology regarding these electric powertrains that finally can be maybe used in a vacuum environment on rails or with kind of rails, but also can be used on the traditional road as we know it. So these things uh, need to be considered and might pose a risk if we don't uh, watch out for those and if we don't go into these interactions um, that are around the other, yeah, around us. Mark, do you see any additional challenges that might uh, come to us in the future? Um, while, well, I fully agree with, with Diana and with Fabio. Um, while it is very expensive to develop those, those systems and, it's, and, and finding the right, the right places to build them and, 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 and get them up and running, I think having them operated and, and, and running them is, is yet another very expensive cost. Uh, so when we have um, finally invested in those hyperloops, we expect them to run for, for a very long time in order to, to pay back for the money. Now, at the same time, we have an evolving technology. And, and one of the challenges is how can we make sure that the infrastructure we build for those hyperloops are, are, um, are so flexible that they can cater to the evolving technology of, of the pods, of the transportation and, and other uses. So, so I believe that's one of the, of the challenges we need to, to um, think about as well. Well, it's incredible. Not only Hyperloop runs at great speed, but also the time for our panel is almost over. So one last audience question that is for everyone. So feel free to jump in. And it's coming from Adrian Engel, who's asking, considering the time and money it will take to build the infrastructure for Hyperloop, is there a risk that other technologies for example, autonomous vehicles or drones will evolve faster and render the Hyperloop virtually obsolete. What are your thoughts about this? Uh, I can, I can, uh, Joe, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, so I, I think one of the things that um, I find fascinating about Hyperloop is that um, the way we're designing the system um, accommodates some of these new technologies. Um, so we're, um, I, I, you know, we heard about um, uh, augmented reality, and uh, art there was a question about artificial intelligence, and um, you know, all of these things we are we are building into the system so that it is um, it can be smart and also future proof. Um, one of the benefits of building something completely from scratch is that you don't have the legacy systems that you are working with um, with some of the the um, other modes. Right. So I think we really have an opportunity to actually build um, a system, uh, a new technology, a new mode of transportation that takes into um, account the values that we have today, um, uh, both in terms of cost, but also sustainability um, and, and, and things like that. Um, we are absolutely looking at how we can integrate um, with these new modes of transportation. Um, I don't think they necessarily have to be mutually exclusive. I think um, Hyperloop offers a different value proposition to autonomous vehicles and to um, vertical takeoff and landing. Um, I think some of those other um, modes may be for how you might want to get around within a city. Um, I think Hyperloop is, is ultimately better suited for long distance travel. Joe, you also wanted to jump in? I think as long as it has a need for speed, I don't see a better solution than traveling in a vacuum environment. All the other systems need too much energy. If you go airborne, it will take 
a long way that we are CO2 neutral. And for, in my opinion, it's also a good solution for populated areas as you can put everything underground and you can connect it with existing systems. And therefore I believe this is a very good solution. That's also my motivation with gray hairs and almost retired or retired and reemployed to uh, get involved. And I like to support Eurotube and the Hyperloop system on, on these ideas. Great thing. Great, and if Mark or Fabio want to jump in for a last statement, feel free. Well, what, what I believe um, we need to, to, to consider is the Hyperloops, they have, they have a clear niche where, where, they, where they are very um, good at, and they were going to be good at high volumes of, of passengers or, or, or um, cargo being transported. And I think that's going to be really difficult for autonomous cars to, to keep up with that, with that big volume that they can transport. Um, so um, what I see is a future where, where a lot of those concepts will indeed interact with each other and, and coexist. Mm -hmm. We're running a little bit late, but one final statement also from Frappio so that we don't leave you out. <laughs> sure, happy to do so. Maybe just to add there, from, from my point of view, there will be different types of hyperloops, there will be different diameters, there will be different turning radii, there will be maybe also different pressure environments. I think depending on the speed regime, there, there might be kind of sub typologies of the actual prime or vanilla hyperloop infrastructure. Um, and this will then make us uh, flexible enough to accom accommodate for different needs. Maybe it is also a Tesla kind of or vehicle kind of uh, yeah, road vehicle kind of system that, that is able to go into a tube environment. I think there the, the vision can be can be still be shaped by all of us. Um, but I think once again, I think it's very important that uh, these conversations are are held, that are really um, yeah, that people come together and really discuss the actual needs uh, for the technology development. And that's what we tried to do today. So that was a very interesting conversation. There were a lot of viewer questions. Thank you again for these brilliant questions. We tried to tackle as many as we could. We Unfortunately, we ran out of time. Um, so I would like to thank Joe Haller again, Diana Zhu, Mark von Heinigen, and Fabio Dubois for their excellent inputs and sharing the initiatives and what is going on. I hope you guys liked what we talked about today. A week ago, we talked about cargo, the future of cargo and Hyperloop, today about infrastructure. Today, in a week, we will be sharing a few video statements from entrepreneurs, startups, and executives from Europe and Silicon Valley about the future of Hyperloop and passenger travel. So feel free to tune in for that. It will not be a live event. It will be a pre-recorded video statement. But these are my closing uh, statements. Thank you guys very much for joining us. It was a great conversation with you guys. Thanks again. Thank, Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.